$764 up to the Sunday school. Each one here, and if you're here visiting, we'll serve the Lord this morning. Brother Bobby. say a good morning to you. Let's get a hymnal and turn to 333. Stand up for Jesus. And we, God's people, need to stand up for him. We see a lot of things going on in this world that's not pleasing to our thoughts, even to the eye. But let's stand as we sing this hymnal 333. Stand up, stand up for Jesus, ye soldiers of the cross. Lift high his royal banner, it must not suffer wrongs. From victory unto victory, his army shall be. Stand up for Jesus, the trumpet call obey. For to the mighty conflict, in this his glorious day, we let our men now serve him against the numbered foes. Let courage rise with and strength to strength the force. Stand up, stand up for Jesus, stand in his strength alone. The arm of flesh will fail you, ye dare not trust your own. Put on the gospel armor and watch Watching unto prayer, where duty calls our danger, be never wanting there. Thank you. I heard you singing that. You may be seated. <laughs> now let's turn to 233. We need the assurance that God does care. Does Jesus care? Does Jesus care when my heart is pain too deep before birth or soul? As the turtles press and the cares distress and the way grows weary and cold. Oh yes, he cares, I know he cares. His heart is touched with my grief. When the days are weary, I dreary, I know my Savior cares. Does Jesus care when my way is dark with the nameless dread and fear? As the daylight fades into deep, night stage, does he care enough to be near? Oh yes, he cares, I know he cares, his heart is touched with my grief. When the days are weary, the long I dreary, I know my 
Savior cares. Does Jesus care when I've tried and failed to resist some temptation strong? When for my deep grief there is no relief, though my tears flow all the night long. Oh, yes, he cares, I know he cares. His heart is touched with my grief. When the days are weary, the long night weary, I know I say your care. Does Jesus care when I've said goodbye to the dearest on earth to me? And my sad heart aches till it nearly breaks. Is it all? To him does he care? Oh, yes, he cares. I know he cares. His heart is touched with my grief. When the days are weary, a long night dreary, I know. I say your care. I know you people haven't had those problems in your life that this that song talked about. If you're living, you probably had some of them. Now let's to go to two o eight. To God be the glory. <coughs> To God be the glory, great things he hath done. So loved he the world that he gave us his son, who yielded his life and atonement for sin, and opened the life gate that all may go in. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give him the glory, great things he has done. Oh, perfect. Perfect redemption, the purchase of blood to every believer, the promise of God, the vilest offender who truly believes that moment from Jesus a pardon receives. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give him the glory, great things he has done. Great things he hath taught us. Great things he hath done, and great our rejoicing through Jesus the Son. But truer and higher and greater will be our wonder, our transport, when Jesus we see. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the 
team got something for us today
never fails, it never gives up, it never runs out on me. Your love never fails, it never gives up, it never runs out on me. Your love Higher than the mountains that I face Stronger than the power of trial and the change, this one thing remains, this one thing remains. Your love never fails, it never gives up, it never runs out on me. Your love never fails, it never gives up, it never runs out on me. Your love never fails, it never gives up, it never runs out on me. Your love. On and on and on and on it goes. Yes, it overwhelms and satisfies my soul. And I never It never runs out on me. Your love never fails, it never gives up. It never runs out on me. Your love never fails, it never gives up. It never runs out on me. Your love. In death, in life, I'm confident and covered by the of your great love. My debt is pain. There's nothing that can separate my heart from your great love. Your love never fails. It never gives up. It never runs out on me. Your love never fails. It never gives up. It never runs out on me. Your love never fails. It never gives up. It never runs out on me. Your love. And on and on and on and on it goes. Yes, it overwhelms and satisfies my soul. And I never This one thing remains, this one thing remains. Your love never fails, it never gives up, it never runs out on me. Your love never fails, it never gives up, it never runs out on me. Your love never fails, it never gives up. It never runs out on me, your love. All right, our little girls have a special this morning. Yeah. Yeah. Just leave the mic on, okay?
What a blessing that was. Did y'all like the future praise team up here? That was so sweet. Uh, we had this opportunity to continue in our worship by the giving of our tithes and our offerings and to give back a portion of what God has blessed us with. I'm going to ask if you would, if you'd stand this time as our ushers come forward. God is so good. He gives us all that we need, and we get this wonderful opportunity to give back a portion of what he's given to us. That means that he's given us some, somewhat of an excess, isn't that right? And uh, we get to uh, continue in, in uh, the Lord's work here uh, by giving of these offerings. And I'm going to ask at this time of Brother Bobby, if you would lead us in a word of prayer. Amen. You may be seated. Uh, I get, if you look at your notes, I've uh, entitled this as a very interesting title, The Things That Go Bump in the Night. This is to kick off our October series. I know you said, well, it's not October. Well, very short October with you all because of, the, uh, because of drill and because uh, next week, I, don't forget this, we have that uh, this young man, Brett Stewart, he's going to come. He's going to sing some Southern Gospel for us. Great time. If you love Southern Gospel, you know people that love Southern Gospel, bring them out next week. It'll be a good time in the Lord. And um, but this morning we're going to talk about things that go bump in the night And actually I wanted to save this one to the very end But a lot of times God makes me go through a, through a message And as he brings me through it I, I glean some wonderful things and, uh, That I want to impart to you guys this morning uh, We all go through difficult times, don't we? There's not a person in here that has not gone through a difficult time If you haven't, just stand by, it's about to happen um, There are moments that... Um, these are the moments that really test our character. And it's in these moments that determine what we're really made of. And Job, man, Job had it right, didn't he? He said this about trouble. He said, man that is born of woman 
is a few days and full of trouble. And you know what? I think Job kind of cornered the market on knowing what trouble is and how to go through a tough time. There's no one here that, says, that can say, we ha I had it worse than Job. No one here. I don't care what you're going through. You can look at Job and say, man, I didn't have nothing compared to what he went through. And so uh, that's something to be excited about because if he made it through and God helped him through it, guess what? God can help you through whatever you're going through this morning. Um, can I ask you something, though? This is getting on the personal. How do you respond? How do you respond when things go bad? When you go through a dark time, when you become pressed, how do you respond to it? You know, when you squeeze a lemon, and you've heard me say this, you squeeze a lemon, what comes out? A lemon juice comes out, right? You squeeze an orange, what comes out? Orange juice comes out. But what happens when you squeeze a Christian? Christ ought to come out every time. And this morning we're going to look at the response of a Christian when, when things go bump in the night. Um, when things go wrong, it's so easy, isn't it? It's so easy for us to blame God for the circumstance that we're in, to not seek His help, to not seek His guidance. And we think, man, it's God who put me here in the first place. So why would I seek Him any longer? It reminds me of a guy who was walking alongside of a cliff and it was starting to get dark at night. He was walking along and his foot slipped. And uh, he's falling off the side of the cliff and all of a sudden his hand grabs hold of a branch, tree branch right there. And he knows that he can't hang there forever. His arm is starting to give way, and so he starts yelling out like we would, like, help, help, somebody help me. And nobody answers. So he cries out again, help, help. And all of a sudden, a voice comes back and says, says, Jack, Jack, can you hear me? And Jack says, yeah, I can hear you. Where are you? He says, I'm the Lord, Jack. I'm everywhere. And Jack says, the Lord, you mean, you mean God? And that's me. Jack says, oh God, please, please help me. And I promise if you help me and you get me down from here, I'll be a good person. I'll go back to church, serve, serve you for the rest of, your, uh, rest of my life. God says, hold back on them promises. Jack, now this is what I want you to do. I want you to listen very carefully, okay? You listening? He says, yes, God, just tell me what to do. I'll do anything. Okay, I, I want you to let go of the branch. Do what? He said, yeah, I said, I want you to let go of the branch. And so after that, there's a little bit of silence. And Jack starts yelling, help, help, is there anyone else up there? You know, we, we want God to help us, but then he gives us the answer, and we're not really satisfied with the answer, and we start looking for other avenues, don't we? We start looking for other answers. And uh, Paul was someone who knew what it meant to suffer, and let me say this, he suffered well. And that, if there's one thing I want from you this morning is that you get this, how to suffer well. And we're all going to suffer, right? few days, but full of trouble. How do you go through those times of trouble? How do you respond when things go bad, when things go bump in the night? I want you to consider Paul's resume. He gives it for us, for us in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. This is not our main text. I just wanted to give you this because it's like, well, Paul doesn't know anything about suffering. Well, hang on. Let's look what, he's, what he has to say about it. Look what in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse starting verse 23, or verse 24, I'm sorry. Uh, it says, Of the Jews five times received I forty stripes, save one. He says, Thrice was I beaten with rods, once was I stoned, thrice was I, sh I suffered ship, uh, shipwreck, a night and a day have I been in the deep. He says, In journeyings often, in perils of water, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, perils by the heathen, perils in the city, perils in the wilderness, perils in the sea, perils with false brethren, and weariness, and painfulness, and watchings often, and hunger, and thirst, and fastings often, and cold, and naked. I believe Paul knew what it meant to suffer and go through a hard, and hard time. And so when we look at this, Paul and Silas, uh, your main text is Acts chapter 16. You can go ahead and uh, turn there. Acts chapter 16, Paul and Silas are thrown into a prison. It's like, well, what did they do wrong? Somebody goes to jail, you automatically say, hey, what did they do? Well, they were just telling people about Jesus. Okay, there's a woman who uh, had a demon. She had a demon, and she was able to tell people's fortunes uh, because of that demon or whatever. And Paul cast out that demon. That woman got wonderfully saved. And the people that were profiting off of her started making and started charging Paul and Silas with false accusations. 
and uh, falsely charge them. They get put in prison, and this is where our story picks up. Acts 16, verse 23. It says, uh, it says, And when they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely, who, having received such a charge, thrust them into the inner prison and made their feet fast in the stocks. Get this, this is our main verse right here. We'll, we'll come back to it. Verse 25, And at midnight Paul and Silas prayed, sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately, and immediately the doors were opened and everyone's bands were loosed. And the keeper of the prison awake out of his sleep, and seeing the prison doors open, he drew out his sword, and he would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had been fled. But Paul cried out with a loud voice, saying, Do thyself no harm, for we are all here. Then he called for a light and sprang in and came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved and thy house. Let's pray together. Father, we come to you, and Lord, we're thankful for um, this wonderful passage of Scripture. Lord, that your word, that accomplishes what you set to accomplish, and we, with anticipation, look forward to what you're going to do in our hearts this morning. And Lord, I pray for, uh, pray for those who may be discouraged. I pray for those who go through difficult times. That, Lord, that they would learn the lessons of how to suffer well, as Paul did. And when things go bump in the night, Lord, we know that our feet are standing upon a rock that cannot be shaken. And, Lord, it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So I want you to know that we're going to look at verse 25. 25 is the main text of what we're going to look at. How did Paul respond to be thrown in prison on false charges? All right, a rigged jury, false charges, and thrown into jail. How do you think you would respond? Oh, that's so-and-so. I can't believe they threw me in jail here, and they were wrong. And you know what? Silas, you agree with me, right? Yeah, yeah, we, they're wrong about this. And look at, the, look at the accommodations in this prison. It's horrible. Do you see how that would have worked if this was different? We wouldn't have this part of the story if this is what, the way they responded. How you respond to darkness. How you respond to darkness makes a world of difference that we'll see here in a minute. But I want you to notice the first thing that they did, they prayed. Now, I know that seems overly obvious, right? Of course you pray. Whenever you go through a bad time, what do you do? Yeah, of course I pray. Why aren't you praying? That's what you start saying, right? And, and when we look at this, many people don't understand what prayer is. Okay, Prayer is not that you get your will done here on earth. It's that God's will would be done here on this earth. And what prayer consists of? It is aligning your will to His. His is not going to change. You need to align yourself to His will when you're going through difficulty, when you're going through a tough time. Now, prayer consists of three elements. Uh, prayer consists of three elements, and I want you to look with me in uh, Matthew 6. You see the prayer that Jesus instructed His followers how to pray, and this is what He has. He says, he says, Our Father, you know this prayer, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us of our debtor, debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Now first I want you to see the first element of prayer, and this is for your notes. I don't have your notes up here, so you're going to have to just follow along with me. The first thing you see is the who in prayer. It's always good to remember who you're talking to, isn't it? Because if you forget who you're talking to, your problems just stay big, don't they? Say, God, look how big these problems are. Look how big these things are. Look how terrible this life is. And if you start saying, look, God, you're so big. God, there's nothing you do wrong. Everything you do is wonderful. There's not a thing that I have not already thought that you already know I thought it. There's not, you know my thoughts are far off. You know where I'm going, where I'm going to lie down. You know everything about me, God. And this is much bigger. You're much bigger 
than this problem. And you see what happens to your problems? They kind of shrink down a little bit, don't they? When you get things in the context of who God is, things kind of shrink down. And if, you, if you're wondering who it is that you're talking to, remember this, God spoke and it stood fast. That's what the scripture says. All that you see, all that's been created, God just spoke it into existence. All right? He's the one, get this, he's the one that loved you so much that he gave his only begotten son to die for you in your place. The one who has conquered death, the one who is coming again to rule and reign for a thousand years, to him be the glory. That is who you're talking to. Now, problems shrink when that happens, doesn't it? And you sometimes, I get like this sometimes, I forget why I even was praying to him in the first place. I say, man... What, was, what did I come here for? Have you ever done that before? You go into a room and forget why you came in there? You know, it's, it's kind of like because you got so preoccupied with something that you forgot about that. And when you get so preoccupied with how big and how great God is, watch all those problems. He's like, what did I come in here for? I already forgot God. So, again, once we acknowledge who we're talking to, uh, the next thing is, is we look at the first is the who. Now we look at what. What do, you, what do you pray for, right? God knows everything that you're going to say before you say it. What do you pray? For? What do you pray for? Well, He tells you there in the model prayer for His kingdom to come and His will to be done. Again, prayer is not about you getting your will done. It's about aligning yourself with what God has already willed. Now, this is the struggle of prayer. This is what you'll probably spend the most time praying right here. Because God, I want this. God, give me this. I need this. And the hardest part is, is understanding that his will may be no. And so when you understand that part, when you can finally get to this part where you can get this out of your mouth and mean it with your heart, your kingdom come. It's your will that needs to be done. He isn't coming again to set up your kingdom. He's coming to set up his kingdom. And when we can, with confidence and assurance, pray, Thy will be done, I think that you're, you're on the second step of prayer. Now, the third part of prayer is the part of needs, okay? That's the things that we need, okay? Our daily bread, right? You need to eat. I need to eat. I love to eat. In fact, you know, I'm thinking about food right now. I'm hungry. And so maybe this will shorten things up, right? So our daily bread, the things that we need on a day-to-day -day basis, you know what? He knows those needs. But it's good to always ask, isn't it? Just because, you know, my son needs something to drink, something out of the fridge or something like that, I'm always glad he kind of points to the fridge because he knows I'm the only one that can open it. You know, it's, it's things like that and things that, you know, you honor God with. That's why we pray for the food. God, thank you for the food that you've given me, knowing it came from him. So th these are the needs, our daily bread. Man, and forgive us our debts. Man, I need forgiveness so many times. I need forgiveness. These are needs that we need on a day-to-day -day basis. We need our food. We need, we need shelter. We need clothing. But man, more than that, we need forgiveness. And then the deliverance from evil. Man, my foot's so easy to go that way. It's so easy to get caught up in sin. You just don't even realize it. You'll be flipping through the channels and not even realize that something terrible has just come on TV and your mind just goes on autopilot and you don't even realize how bad it is. Can I tell you, I need to be delivered from those times. Because that can affect me. It can cause my foot to slip. It can cause me to think thoughts that are not edifying, things that are not good. So I need that deliverance. And so these are the needs. So we got the who, we got the what, and we have the needs. These are the three elements of prayer. So when Paul and Silas were falsely accused, thrown in the prison that's under the prison, with the worst of society, no bathrooms, chained and shackled, what was the first thing that they did? They prayed. So what is the first thing that you do when you go through a tough time? It ought to be prayer. It ought to be seeking the face of God. And if you'll seek his face, if you'll seek the first the kingdom of God, his righteousness, all those things that you're worried about, just watch them fall into place. Now, so the first thing is on the verse 25 it says they prayed. And what's the next thing? You, you can easily gloss over this and miss something important right here. It says the next thing they did is that they praised God. 
You praise God. And a lot of times people ask, well, how long are you supposed to pray? How long are you supposed to pray? When you can transition from that prayer into a song of praise, that's when you've prayed enough. Now, I like this, this part because they're praising God, not when things are good, but when things have actually gone bad. They couldn't get any worse. They're sitting there with open sores on their back. They're chained. They're shackled. They're put in an uncomfortable place. Sanitation is horrible. The, I guarantee you the company is horrible that they're keeping. Everything is bad. But what do they do? They praise God. And I like what the psalmist said in Psalm 77. He said, they had a song in the night. Do you have a song in the night when, things, when the light goes out? Do you have something to sing about? David, who wrote that song, said there's a lot to sing about. And I want us to look there. Psalm 77, uh, verse 11 said this. He says this. Psalm 77, verse 11. There's verse 6. I call to remembrance my song in the night. I commune with my own heart, and my spirit made diligent search. What is he searching for? This song in the night, what does it bring out? Verse 11. I will remember the works of the Lord. Surely I will remember thy wonders of old. I will meditate also of, of all thy work and talk of thy doings. Thy way, O God, is in the sanctuary where is so great a God as our God. What a question. Thou art the God that does wonders. Thou hast declared thy strength among the people. Thou hast with thine arm redeemed thy people, the sons of Jacob and Joseph. Selah. So what is this song? What does this song consist of? Well, what you're going to find is, is that the psalm... The psalmist was trying to remember the past. He was bringing up the past. Now, why do you bring up the past? So you can remember the things that God has done previous to this point in time. Because we get so caught up, God, it's not what have you done for me, it's what have you done for me lately. And you can easily forget the things that God has done for you. Now, there are three things that this praise that the psalmist has here. There are three elements to it. The first is, the first is the things that God has done. That is, his faithfulness. When was the last time you went without food? Now, Wesley, don't, don't start thinking about that. When was the last time you went without food? God has always been faithful in providing, hasn't he? He has been faithful to you. You can get so caught up in what God ha you think God hasn't done, you forgot about all the wonderful things he has done. He's given you a wonderful family. That's something to praise God about, isn't it? He's given you a wonderful family. He's given you maybe a livelihood. He's given you a place to live. He's given you shelter. He's given you so many wonderful things. I praise God for this church. He's given me a wonderful church to serve in. There's a lot of good things that you can start praising God about. But if you get to a point where you're sulking, you're not singing a song of praise. You're singing a song of, oh, woe is me. I'm undone. All life is terrible. You know what? You need to be reminded. I need to be reminded. That's why Peter was saying, I want to stir up your earthly minds by call of remembrance. I want to stir you to remember the things of God. And this is exactly what the psalmist did, is that it is a part of your life to think back on the wonderful things that God has done for you. The second thing is that the things that he can do, it says that he, can do, he does wondrous things. That denotes his power. You know that God could bring about deliverance, whatever you're going through. God could bring it about like that. He could do it by the snap of his fingers. It doesn't take anything. And you just need to praise him for how good he is and how powerful he is. And know that if it, no means no, it means there's something better. There's just something better. All things work together for good, right? To them that love the Lord, who are called according to his purpose, all things, that's everything. And so you have to understand that that means there's something better coming down the pipeline. It just means wait a little while. Now, and the last one is his salvation. The salvation. He says, thou hast redeemed thy people. That is the redemption that we have. Guys, if God didn't answer not one more prayer, if he never answered one more prayer, and you have Jesus Christ, you've been saved, that's enough to sing for eternity. That's enough to sing for eternity. It's like, well, I, I don't know when God has done anything for me in the past. And, 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 you know, I don't know. 
I don't know if he's ever going to do anything. That's okay. He's already done something. If you've got Jesus Christ, you've got everything. And if he didn't answer another prayer, you've got enough to praise him for eternity. So, listen to me. Your world may shake. The world around you may seem like it crumbles, but your feet are not set on this world. Your feet ought to be set on the rock that is unshakable. The rock of ages. And the context of what we know, understand this, the context of what you know is God's faithfulness, God's power, and God's promise. All things work together for good to those who love God, to them who are called according to His purpose. Listen, I might be down. You might be down, but I've got a song to sing. Do you have a song to sing in the night? You know, we do have a song, and I look forward to that song. It's a, in the Revelation, it talks about the song of the redeemed. Now, I don't know what that song is, but man, I, I think of that hymn redeemed, redeemed, how I love to proclaim it, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, redeemed through His infinite mercy, His child and forever I am. Boy, that, that'll make you shout. That's something to sing about. So the question now comes, why is this so important? Brother Heath, why, when I go through a tough time, why can't I go over here in my little corner, in dark corner, and sulk and have my pity party? Why can't I do that? Why, why do I have to pray? Why do I have to praise God? Why do I have to do this when all I want to do is stay in bed and forget everything else, close up the doors, and just be by myself? Why is this so important? Because of your final point. People watch how you suffer. Did you ever know that? People are watching how you suffer. Verse 25, it says that, that they heard them. The prisoners heard heard them, okay? That means they observed, they heard, they took note of these men. Why is that? Because if you get down in a situation, you can forfeit your opportunity. Get this, you will forfeit your opportunity to, re to revealing Christ to someone else. It will happen. We don't sorrow, guys. We don't sorrow like the rest of the world. We don't sorrow like those who don't have any hope. We have a wonderful hope in Jesus Christ. And that's what we have something to praise about, right? We have a wonderful hope that one day he's going to come. Amen. He's going to come, split that eastern sky, and we will be taken up with those who have gone on before us in Christ, and we'll be taken up together with them in the clouds. And there shall we ever be with the Lord. We have something to look forward to. You know, the rest of the world, you look at the news, man, there ain't nothing to look forward to. Have you looked at it lately? I just kind of don't want to watch it anymore. Because, and, I, and when I get in those times of discouragement, I just go ahead and just turn back into Thessalonians and to 1 Corinthians 15, and I just think about, there's a great catching up I'm looking forward to. And so we have something to hope in. Now, that blessed hope, it says, and I love what Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, he says, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man to ask you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. And I like that. It says, be ready always. What about when I'm having a bad day? Always. What about when I'm having a good day? It says always. Be ready to give an account, a reason of the hope that is within you. Now think about it. Paul and Silas, they get thrown into prison. And what's the first question people want to ask? When you get thrown in prison and all the other prisons, what you in here for? What'd you do? I'm sorry, guys. I'm going to turn that off. It's horrible. Segways into that. You can get so easily caught up and woe is me and forget about all the wonderful things and opportunities of Christ has given you. If you understood that God is leveraging your circumstances for the people around you, how differently would you live if you knew that? You'd be, you'd be ready, right? You'd be ready to always give an account. That's why Paul in the book of Philippians, he's writing to the same church in the same area that he's being prison. He says, he says uh, let your conversation be as concerning the gospel. Always make a, if you can't transition what you're saying to what the gospel is, you don't need to be saying it. So, why is this so important? Why is this so important? Because people are going to watch how you suffer. And can I exhort you this morning? Suffer well. Suffer well. 
And I love this passage of Scripture because there's, there's such a simplicity in the gospel presentation here. Look with me again. Verse 26 of Acts 16. I have it there for you on your screen. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately all the doors were open, and, their, their one ba- and everyone's bands was loosed. And the keeper of the prison, awaking out of his sleep and seeing the prison doors open, he drew out his sword and would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had been fled. But Paul cried out with a loud voice, saying, Do thyself no harm, for we are all here. Then he called for a light, sprang in, came trembling, and fell down before Paul and Silas and, and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? What a question. Man, you couldn't ask for a better question. A preacher, I, that's one of the questions I always look forward to hearing from people, if I ever get to hear it. What do I got to do to be saved? Oh, well, let me tell you about Jesus. And then, what does it say? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. And maybe you're here, and you're at the end of your rope. You're at the end of your rope. You're kind of like this jailer here, and you've looked around, and you say, All hope is lost. It's not, there's nothing worth living for anymore. Can I give you a hope, a blessed hope? Can I tell you that if you put your faith and your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, you can be saved, that you have a hope in Christ that's out of this world? Now, what a question that is. What must I do to be saved? You know, how did he know to ask that question? Did you ever wonder that? How did this Philippian jailer know to ask that question? Because I want you to get this, because this is what we're closing on. He saw how they suffered. He saw how when they were suffering, and they could have been singing, Woe is me, they were singing, Praise to a God who cannot be contained. You know, they were, that jail cell closed, and it kept Paul and Silas in there, but it couldn't keep God out. And that's what we have to have is a faith that when we go through a tough time, we begin to pray. And Lord willing, that prayer breaks out into song and people begin to see and look to see how you suffer. You know, I was, I was wanting to share this, this last testimony. My wife was telling me a story about one of her professors who's not a God-fearing person. We've been going through all kinds of things and she's had to ask uh, out of school a couple of times and the professor just, asked, I don't know if he accidentally said it, he just said, how are you going through this stuff? All this terrible stuff. How are you handling this? And she said very, I mean, without any hesitation, because of the grace of God, I make it every day. Guys, we have something, we have a wonderful hope. And even when things are bad, we have something to praise God about. I'm going to ask our musicians if we, as they come, and I'm going to ask as we prepare for our invitation, maybe you're here and you, you're like that Philippian jailer and you need to ask that question. What must I do to be saved? What, what am I, what do I have to do? Well, first of all, let me tell you something, guys. You do nothing. Christ has done everything. He died on the cross and he died in your place for your sin. And if you'll put your faith and your trust in him, the scripture says, you shall not perish, but you shall have everlasting life. Maybe here and you need to join the Lord's church and what you work with. You do over here on this church. What has God has got for you to offer today? I pray that you. Him 162, whosoever will.